Welcome back, honors. All right, so we are gonna be using a recycled flip from last year, uh, just so we can stay on pace, so I can get this thing up before S period, so y'all can be able to go to challenge tonight, have a good time, and whoop some Raider butt. Now, the big thing about it, though, going into this, uh, make sure you pay close attention. I know it's a little longer than we wanted it to be, um, but it just kind of is what it is. But just to give you a heads up, it's going to make it so we can review a little bit in class tomorrow um, with that little time that we have. And then also, it's going to make your study guide a lot shorter. So we will talk about this in class tomorrow as well. But this is going to be the last flip going into your test. This is the last we're learning for this unit. And so you can start studying after this flip and y'all can go ahead and start tackling it. But check back on your study guide as well, because like I said, I'm about to delete that back section and we're just going to shove that onto the next unit to make everybody's life a little bit easier. But I'll see y'all then. Y'all have a good one. Welcome back, Chappelle. All right. Oh, whoa, excuse me. Welcome back, honors. All right. So we are going to try and keep this flip mighty short and because it's a weekend you know what i mean a little weekend flip little uh finishing up german unification flip under the rule of otto von bismarck bismarck well technically not the rule of otto von bismarck but the chancellorship the politician work the the guiding beacon that was otto von bismarck so really really quick what we got into already which might have seemed a little bit confusing a little all over the place uh let's go ahead and just kind of jump backwards real fast and talk for two seconds about the things that led up to this German unification movement. Of course, some of the biggest things being the fact that most German-speaking people during the entirety of the history of Europe lived in a several different phases of what you would call Germany. Okay, so most of the people that spoke German during these time periods lived in one of the following three things. From 800 to about 1800 AD, they lived in what was known as the Holy Roman Empire, which I'm throwing up there right now. As you can see, this covers most of modern day Germany. And then after that fell, when Napoleon invaded, they existed inside of the Confederation of the Rhine, which is located in the center of this map right here in Napoleon's Grand Empire. And then after Napoleon was exiled, German people lived in what was known as the German Confederation in this map that I'm throwing up now. Um, of course, that's going to be from 1858 to about 1864. And in the German Confederation, there were two very prominent states, as you can see in the map, go in and out of the German Confederation. That's Prussia and Austria. So during all this tumultuous time where, what is the country I live in? Am I in a principality? Where are we anyway? Following the Congress of Vienna, we're going to fast forward to 1848 and the chaos that ensued in places like Prussia, Austria, and other German-speaking lands oh, is going to lead people like Otto von Bismarck, but particularly Otto von Bismarck, to decide it is time to unite the German states as one, with Prussia being their leader. And why did he do this? Why did he want to do this? Mostly just because he felt like it. He is not all of these different isms that you may think. A lot of you are like, oh man, he must be a classical liberal, or oh, I bet he's a socialist. He's actually very far from a socialist. He's more like, I personally feel, just very opportunistic. A lot of people argue they're like, oh, Otto von Bismarck was a skilled genius with one idea in mind, creating a unified German state. I think he was a lot more reactionary, but I think he was perfect at reacting. He knew how to improvise really well, and he understood that for the German people to be strong, they needed to all be united into one consolidated country. So he decided to take up that bannerman of nationalism, that bannerman of self-determination, and he's going to push forward. And he's going to take the lead with Prussia, and he's going to create what you know as modern-day Germany. And some of y'all are probably immediately asking, like, well, why didn't Austria get in the mix? Well, calm down, calm down, calm down. We will get into that in a minute, okay? But the biggest things is, we got to talk about his methods, okay? His big, big methods. And no, that's not him. That's just the man he supports. So, speaking of his methods, he used particularly three methods to unite all the German states together, with Prussia being out front. He decides, first of all, to use... He's the best example of this new concept that you haven't, we haven't discussed yet, which you need to star and underline. It's known as... Realpolitik, right? Or realistic politics. Realpolitik is this idea of being anti-romantic. So the romantics, as you remember, with their art and their poetry and 
Grimm's Fairy Tales and Alexander Dumas, Three Musketeers and Lord Byron and like all these other people were very romantic in this idea that politicians were led by intense emotions and almost as if they were being led by God himself into the divine way. Well, Bismarck was like, that doesn't make any sense. Realistically speaking, if you want to get things done, you got to get them done quick and they got to be based on current need. So, for example, if your king wants to modernize the army, but the legislative branch won't let him raise taxes, just do it anyway. If uh, you don't want to ally with that one other country because you think down the road it could be a negative thing, then just don't do it. So, realistically, he used a great series of methods through this concept known as Realpolitik. And the thing about the military, the military modernization, he actually did do that. When his king, the man down here, monarch... Wilhelm is what we're going to call him because it's his proper German name. We're not going to call him William like all the English-speaking people do. But Wilhelm I, who is a part of the majestic Hohenzollern family that has led all of, whatchamacallit, all of, who am I talking about? Oh, all of Prussia since the 1600s. Mil Wilhelm wanted to modernize the army. He's like, I want an army that will rival that in Europe. I want an army that is extremely strong, very well equipped, and very well able to go out and do anything I needed to. And Otto von Bismarck was like, okay, well, we just got to raise taxes to be able to do that. And a lot of classical liberals were like, no, no, no. Don't raise taxes on our businesses for your military, you conservative. And Bismarck says, all right, I'm just going to do it anyway. And he did. He just literally went out and collected taxes and supported Wilhelm's efforts. And so a lot of this can be seen in one of his most famous acts as... Hold on, a little sip of coffee. Mm. Also, it's beautiful outside. Definitely try to get out as soon as you possibly can. I'm building a garden tomorrow. I'm very excited about it. Uh, getting into it, though, one of the best examples of him using this idea of real, real politik or realistic politics is in a speech he gave that has now been titled the Blut und Eisen speech. Now, notice I left a word out there. It's supposed to be Blut und Eisen, all right? Blut und Eisen means blood and iron in German. And so in this speech, he called for military strength, and he also called for being realistic in our efforts to come together because he said that the questions of the day will not be made by pen, signing documents, or liberal agendas, they will be answered with blood and iron, which is a very, very, very realistic way of looking at things. He's like, look, if we're going to get anything done, we have to be aggressive, we have to be after it, we've got to get after it. And that, of course, right there, that's Wilhelm. Oh, Wilhelm. I don't know if that's his hair in the back that's messed up. It looks kind of like Mr. Terry in class every now and again, because I'll get this like little like one squibbly little guy. I've never really actually known what that is. But Wilhelm I was a solid king, right? But he was kind of overshadowed by the fact that the real man behind the scenes was, of course, his chancellor, Otto von Bismarck. And so his third method, third method, are called his, jot this down, wars of annexation. So that should go in that list with Realpolitik, and then a little subset, Blut Eisen, that's the sec, like, that's 1.1. Blut und Eisen is 1.1. Realpolitik, and then, what was the other one? Oh, support of the Hohenzollern family. And then the third one is his wars of annexation. So Prussia knew that the only way to actually gobble up all these other German states and create a Germany was to have to annex them. But you can't pull a Hitler and start just annexing stuff left and right because it's going to lead to other powers coming down on you and destroying you. Or pulling a Napoleon. Napoleon just starts annexing all this stuff left and right. The other powers combine together and they will stop you. So Prussia, led by Bismarck, has a genius idea. He's like, let's go have some wars, right? So this is what it looked like originally. So Prussia is right here, the big area in the blue. And then this is all the area that they're going to start adding. This is that territory gained from... Uh, that's from the Division of Poland, and actually when they became Prussia Brandenburg, and then they're going to add this in the Schleswig-Holstein affair, and then they're going to add this later on. But how are they going to do this? Through wars of annexation. Now, one of the big early wars was known as the Second Schleswig War, all right? Schleswig-Holstein is a very, very important thing. So I'm going to say it one more time, and I'm going to throw the words up here, and I'm going to pronounce them for you, okay? Here we go. Schleswig-Holstein. Schleswig, Holstein. Schleswig, Holstein. All right, so those two areas are actually 
German-speaking provinces. And I have them denoted right here with an indifferent face and a smiley face. The Schleswig area is up here in the north. The Holstein area is down here in the south, okay? So notice that they are not controlled early on by Prussia. And this is making them very, very frustrated. The Prussians are like, those are German-speaking people. We want to incorporate them into our Germany. And so he decides to have a war, and he calls it the Second Schleswig War. And what he does, he's like, oh, Austria, y'all speak German. You're a German state. Ally with us, and let's run Denmark. Yeah, because that's Denmark up here, out of these two areas that they own. Because Denmark tried to pass a liberal constitution that would have made Schleswig-Holstein a part of their actual country borders. And in this effort, Austria and Prussia are like, no, 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 Schleswig-Holstein, they speak German. They do not speak Danish, you little weirdos. And so they have a war that only lasts nine months. And Pru Prussia and Austria are able to rid Schleswig-Holstein out of Denmark and liberate them from them. And Prussia takes over Schleswig in the north, and they give Austria Holstein in the south, which is very, very odd. Why would you do that? Why would you not give Austria the territory further from you? It's because they had a plan the entire time. Prussia was like, oh, now we're going to turn on Austria and we're going to fight the Austro-Prussian War. We're going to fight Austria for Holstein, right? And some of you are like, this sounds like a terrible idea because Austria has been strong for like hundreds and hundreds of years. You probably shouldn't do that, Bismarck. That, ah, but you have to understand, remember, when I said Wilhelm wanted to modernize his army. And so Bismarck said, okay, and goes out and collects all those taxes for him. This was the thing that gave him the leg up. So maybe, maybe Bismarck just was like the luckiest guy on the planet, right? I gotta make like a little pseudo table. The luckiest guy on the planet and just happened to, you know, stumble into this, like kind of fell butt backwards into it. But they actually had a very modern military, unlike the Austrians. The Austrians were still using front-loading, hi, sweetheart, uh, front-loading muskets, all right? And they were so, hey, sweetheart, can you put two chicken legs in the stove for me? I love you. Thank you. All right. Sorry, it's about lunchtime. Um, so the Austrians were using front-loading muskets, and the best firing mechanisms in the or fire soldiers. That's what we're for. Best marksmen and soldiers in the world could only fire about two shots per minute. Now, the Prussians, on the other hand, with the aid of all that tax money, were all carrying this new type of weapon. It's known as the Dreisha, or not Dreisha. Excuse me. The Dreisa Needle Gun. This is the very first bolt-action breech-loading gun that has a firing pin inside of it. So you see the bolt right here? You see this little knob? You would pull up on that, pull the bolt back, take this little acorn-looking thing that looks a lot like a modern-day bullet, shove it inside the barrel, bolt in, pull up, shoot, and everything is packed inside of that barrel already instead of having to load it in the front of your musket like the Austrians are running around doing, okay? So, the Prussians are able to win that war very quickly, and they do it in two months. It takes no time at all. And after they do that, they established their new confederation. They called it the North German Confederation. Now, this is where the disputed territory was. That's Schleswig, and that's Holstein. Now, this is Prussia. That's Brandenburg. All these other states here in the middle saw Prussia beat Austria, and they were like, look, if we're going to ally with anybody, let's ally with the winners. And so they decided to just join Prussia in these efforts of annexation. Now, you'll notice, though, in the orange down in the south, there's a different region, and it's this region right here. they got to figure out how are they going to recycle those guys into the North German Confederation. There's a big reason why that area, let's give that area a name real quick. That area is called, to you in English, Bavaria. In German, they refer to it as Bayern. All right, so Bavaria is down here, very close to France. They are devoutly Catholic, very wealthy, and they are very well known for, oh, for example, in Bavaria, if you ever get a chance to go, there is the, uh, oh, what's it called, what's it called, what's it called? There's the castle. I'm going to throw a picture of it real quick while I look up the name of it really, really fast. Uh, it's Crazy Ludwig. Uh, Ludwig II, uh, Disney Castle, Bavaria. Uh, I think it's, it starts with an H. I swear it starts with an H. It's the, uh, oh, here we go. No, it starts with an N. The Neuschwanstein Castle, built by a little guy named Leopold II. Um, 
or Ludwig, Ludwig, Ludwig the second, not Leopold the second. That's an Austrian name. Uh, Ludwig the second, crazy Ludwig, uh, built this castle, and that castle is in Bavaria, and it's the inspiration for Walt Disney's uh, Cinderella castle. And of course, Cinderella being originally told in Europe as a Grimm's fairy tale from the Romantic period. But Bavaria is very wealthy, as you can see with that castle. They're also very Catholic. The North German Confederation, on the other hand, is devoutly Protestant. They're all Lutherans. So how are you going to get the wealthy Catholics to join you if they don't like your religion or your politics? And some of y'all are probably me like, well, they speak German. Aren't they German people? Yeah, but they consider themselves Bavarians or Bayernians. Uh, so what are you going to do? The enemy... Of my enemy is my friend. If there's one thing Lao Tzu never got wrong when he wrote his book called The Art of War, if you're trying to get somebody to join you that might be your enemy, find a common enemy. Now, even Pope Urban II during the Crusades knew this, so what are you going to do? Start a war with France. German people don't like the French. Ever since Napoleon came in and took all over Europe, took over all of Europe, the French and the Prussians have had an ultimate disdain for one another. And so, what are you going to do? Start a war with France to try and quickly win that war. Now, a lot of people are like, wait, wait a second. But isn't Napoleon's grandnephew, Napoleon III, in charge, of this, uh, in, in charge of France right now? He is. And he is a very militaristic leader as well. So this is a big gamble. Honestly, Bismarck just kind of threw the dice on this one. And Napoleon III was in charge of France at the time. And France became very modern and was very strong and very wealthy. But Prussia is going to come out as, I'm trying to keep an eye on my time, Prussia is going to come out as the huge underdog winner. But also, here was the other thing. A lot of people are like, well, why would France even want to start this war with the Germans in the first place if they saw them mush the Austrians, which are one of the wealthiest uh, empires during this entire time period? Well, a lot of it has to do with some junk talking. Uh, this right here is called the Ems Telegram. You have to understand, Otto von Bismarck is a master of mass media. He knows how to use newspapers and uh, the high literacy rates of Europeans in the 1800s to his disposal. And so, first of all, when, like, little Luxembourg, little country Luxembourg was looking for a new ruler, they couldn't decide if the ruler was going to be an ally of Prussia or an ally of France. So in an article that he released, he called the French loudmouth, vulgar, prone-to-violent behavior people, not the nice people that they pretend to be. And then also, in a telegram... He had that was sent by the Prussian king. He took a telegram from this place called Ems, E M S, when the Prussian king was at a spa, and he doctored the note to make it look like they might declare war on France. And France then declared war on them. So Bavaria joined them out of like sympathy, and they were like, "Oh my God, France is just declaring war on you!" And at a huge battle called the Battle of the Sedan. Bismarck and the very, very modern German army beats the French army handedly, and within nine months, they take over all of France, and they force them to surrender. This right here is a menu from a French cafe during the Franco-Prussian War, because when the Germans came into France after they captured Napoleon III, of course, they were French about it, and they were like, oh, uh, new revolution, we don't like him! And they have like a little baby revolution, and they start this period called the Paris Commune. And the Paris Commune tries to rule over the city of Paris. Well, the Prussians came in and they were like, look, we can't go in there and kill women, children, and old men. So let's just make a big blockade around the city and they'll starve to death and eventually give up. So to prevent themselves from starving to death, the Parisians started eating zoo animals. If you look closely, you can see entrees that include uh, kangaroo, uh, elephant, uh, sardines. Uh, there's a rat's one right here. Oh, yeah. So, rats, la chatte flanquée des rats, they were eating anything they could find, especially zoo animals and rats, and dogs as well. Uh, so, that was what the French people were doing, because they didn't want, to, didn't want to surrender to the Germans. But, of course, the birth of the German Empire is going to occur in the biggest, the biggest proverbial, uh, like, screw you from the German people ever happens in the Hall of Mirrors, in the Palace of Versailles in 1871, when Wilhelm, it William Wilhelm the first, takes the title of Kaiser or German Emperor, of course named after Caesar Kaiser, uh, of all German states of Germany after winning the war against the French in 1871. So in the Hall of Mirrors, the birth of the German Empire occurs, and you can actually see. Look at our boy. There's Wilhelm right there. There's Bismarck right here in focus. The only one wearing white, and a crowd of people wearing black. And Germany was born in 1871. So he established uh, his biggest efforts early on are going to be like, all right, let's establish a brand new 
German government that is based in German language, culture, credo, based in all things German, okay? That right there is the Reichstag building. So immediately after... My chair broke. Maria! Maria! I need help. The chair broke. No, do not show this to whoever you're FaceTiming with. It's already on video. Help me out of this chair. <laughs> Help me out of this chair. Oh, gosh. You I'm really suck. Ah! Oh. <laughs> I guess we have to buy real furniture now. Okay. I guess I'm going to finish this standing. All right. So, all right. Anyway, I think that'll serve. I guess no editing needed for today because that's going to be funny enough for y'all. Anyway, now he decides to establish a new German-based government. They unite under one language, one culture, one credo, one pride. That's the Reichstag building. Immediately after he comes to power and Germany becomes an empire in 1871, maybe I'll try sitting on these rubber maids because this will totally work, right? There we go. There we go. That'll do for now. Uh, and that's the Reichstag building. So when the German Empire was born, they actually already had a legislative branch, which was like a liberal concession uh, that Bismarck decided to give to the people. Stop laughing! <laughs> so anyway, now, Germany is also going to grow its strength as fast as possible. And what's the quickest way to strengthen your country without going to war? You should probably build up your industry and your welfare state, okay? So this made them an extremely wealthy country and an absolute powerhouse in all of Europe. Go ahead and pause, you can write that down if you want. But these are the way that they're gonna do it. So they decide to build their industry up to, and the way they're gonna do this, they wanna start out with an educated workforce. So under the German empire period after 1871, they decide that it is time to educate their people. And so they create a four-tiered uh, nine-year education system in Germany that's one of the very first socialized educations or education systems. Now, it wasn't fully accessible to everybody, but it was accessible to many more people than it was before because for the longest time, the only people that had uh, schools or schooling education styles for anybody were the Catholics in most of Europe. And so this educated workforce was a big part of it. And this is actually one of the very first, uh, like, graduating yearbook class pictures. Uh, population growth is going to help them out as well. They grew somewhere in the neighborhood of, mm, like, 20 million people in a few years. And then they're going to build ro railroads all over the country. They're going to become a worldwide producer of steel right here. This is Krupp, the Krupp family steel firm. And then they're also going to become a chemical engineering company. God, these Rubbermaids are also starting to collapse. And the Bayer, Bayer is at, like Bayer Aspirin, Bayer Medical and Pharmaceuticals, is one of the earliest German companies created in the Empire period that actually is an idea of their chemical engineering firms. They also, he decides to create, Bismarck decides to create accident and sickness protection for workers. So if you were injured on the job, the government will pay you your stipend to keep you and your family like above the poverty line. Uh, sickness protection, if you have a very, very bad health illness on the job when you're working, you can actually be paid by the government until you're better. They had unemployment benefits started, and this is going to lead to a huge trend in all of Europe where they're going to start making old age pay uh, when, like, Social Security basically was invented in Germany. And, like, these ideas are going to spread. So, as you can see, Bismarck is a genius because he's giving in to some of the things that the liberals and the socialists want because he's a realistic politician. He knows he has to help them, okay? So, going forward, though... He also, Bismarck is not perfect, okay? So I know I advocate for him a lot, but he's not a perfect politician because he tried to use this one other thing to unite all the Germans together because what his biggest fear was when he was uniting Germany as an empire was like, what if people from Frankfurt consider themselves Frankfurters uh, instead of, uh, that's another word for a hot dog. All right, so consider themselves Frankfurters instead of Germans first. What if people from Dusseldorf, uh, like, I believe that they are a part of their, like, county or province instead of actually being a part of the German Empire now? What if Prussians always consider themselves to be uppity Prussians? What do we do about this? And so he decides to use a bad idea, which is called negative integration. He believed that the practice of uniting people together to be considered more German was like, oh, let's turn them against other people. Positive integration is actually trying to do it in a positive sense. Negative integration is by trying to, like, basically point at other people and being like, we hate you. 
Now, no, it's not who you think it is out the gate. Don't be ridiculous. Not all Germans are like that. And then the big one, ironically enough, is they tried to turn all the Protestants in Germany and the German Empire against the Catholics. And they tried to centralize their faith under a Protestant banner. But this is going to fail miserably. And actually, the Lutherans in Germany are like, Bismarck, what the heck, man? We're not trying to tear down Christianity. We're trying to build up a state. And he was like, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then that was a big backfire on him. And then he also tried to outlaw socialism. He tried to outlaw social Democrats after a couple of assassination attempts on Wilhelm I. Uh, yeah, two guys tried to shoot at Wilhelm Helm the first and tried to kill him, which is becoming a very popular trend in Europe during this time period. It's like, let's kill our leaders. Uh, one of the craziest ones is the assassination of Tsar Alexander the first, if you want to go look that up in Russia. But he I tried to outlaw socialism, but that just made socialism a lot stronger. They just moved to other countries and grew their ideas and then came back even stronger. So that failed on him as well. So he's not a perfect politician, but he's still a great one. And then this guy is going to come into power. After all of these efforts to create a united Ger Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II is going to come into power. And this is the son of Kaiser Wilhelm I. This is what he looks like right here. Now, this guy is awful because he's going to fire Bismarck because he believed that he puppeted his father all along and that he believed that he was the big shield in front of him. He's going to start World I, and he's also going to be the worst leader on my board. I think he's one of the wor top ten worst leaders in all of European history. He's absolutely terrible. He had a dead arm. We'll talk about that later, though. I'll talk to you guys later. I hope you all have a great weekend. I'm going to go buy a new chair. I'll see you all later. Have a good one.